Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful individuals. It is another rep of League on Lock. Eric and Mark here with you. Fine, feathered individuals for what was a bit of a bonanza finals weekend. We got reverse sweeps that happened, game fives, of course, silver scrapes, comebacks, games, teams had absolutely no business winning. And at the end of it all, or at least most of it, we're left left with what seems like an inevitability and that is number one gen g coming out on top against t1 chovy setting a record that not even faker the goat himself has done and that is four lck titles in a row yes four lck titles in a row people you need to hear that a second time because it needs to be spoken into existence to believe that this has actually happened that gen g has made this run happen once again in this finals performance oh it was a doozy in this one against t1 we went the full distance silver scrapes and yes siree the lck delivered the hype and uh, i mean of course when you go to game five it's 40 minute plus gen g ends up coming away with the win even though they were very much in control you look at the start and end of this series faker has both the best highlight and the worst low light of the series of course we're talking about when he hops into the rift herald uh and gets blocked by the poppy denial maybe he didn't know or forgot that this was an interaction it's it's a little bit busted truthfully and poppy you don't even need to time it well he presses it like three or four seconds before and oh great see a faker hey there's your example send that clip right to riot right now and tell him it's unfair there it is poppy with that ability uh, this is one of those things where when she was created there's no way they were thinking oh yeah she's gonna prevent you from getting out of the rift herald whatever a rift herald is that you're piloting and getting out of it none of these things go on and unfortunately it is still one of these ones where you do have to you know put that in the l column for old faker because that is certainly an ugly and very poorly timed mistake coming across, especially in a situation of game five where Gen G had accumulated that that strength, had gotten that grab on the game, but it was not nearly a death grab by any stretch in this game five. And T1 had found a little bit of momentum. They had a chance to start pushing through mid. Oh, uh, well, we don't have Oriana anymore because she was riding the Rift Herald, and yeah, that was not a good look. Yeah, they can't contest the Dragon, and then the game only gets further and further out of control there. A deathless bot lane for Gen G, some incredible quirky package engages out of Chovy in that fifth game, but the full story of Game 5 is Keen Sante. 1v3 in multiple times, two separate solo kills on Zeus in that fifth game, he led Gen G to his first ever LCK title. One of the best players in the history of LCK to never win a title. Now he has a trophy. There's a series of events that sets up this game five clutch performance from your boy Keen Sante, getting the Cassante up in the top side. Keen, he's completed it. He's done the full ladder step through of the LCK, the bottom to the top final. Long he's journey. It's a long ladder. For him. It has been a hell of a journey, but let's just say when you looked at Keen and we realized, you know, relatively early on that this guy was going to have legs in his career, was going to be a stable top level option in the top lane for the LCK. You put a team around him that is stable in other avenues, that has success elsewhere. He is going to be a strong avenue, a strong pillar of that team's uh, title aspirations. And you saw that right here, one of the additions for Gen G. The other big one that contributes to this Game 5, Cassante coming through, Canyon in the Jungle. Game 4 says do or die. Backs pushed against the wall, and I really believe this T1 showing those teeth, showing that lethality necessary to threaten Gen G's run for these back to back to back to back lck titles he uh, canyon says give me something that can affect the game give me something that's either gonna be the game changer or gonna be the game ending choice for us in this game for i will take that pressure i will take that responsibility goes on the kha'zix punishes owner and zeus for some careless uh pathing and choices in that game four you go to game five and t1 feels so threatened by it and i feel like this is a massive uh, uh miss uh, you know understanding of the draft and where things were headed 
and they see a, a Gen G that is locked in three squishies, needing some front line, and they say, yes, that Kha'Zix, that's gonna be that front line from game four. Get him out of here. We cannot see that. Oh no, that's keen on Cassante in game five, and the rest is history. Yeah, that's a pretty good front line. Uh, more so than Kha'Zix is the Cassante. But yeah, that fourth game, that was absolute vintage. Dom won. Uh, Canyon coming in, locking in a cane in game five to kind of just throw a huge curveball on this entire draft, as you mentioned, left over uh, to that fifth game. But the momentum was fully in T1's favor before that game four, after they had gone up 2-1, uh, and it was even a competitive, heartbreaking win that Gen G got to stay alive in this series. So this was the full switch of the series, was that fourth game. Yeah, there's absolutely ways you could talk about uh, the first game in this series being one that T1 should have found a way to keep control of that game, should have had the upper hand in closing things out. They don't in game one. They do get the bounce backs for game two and three. And of course, one of them being one against a nine and two Aurelian soul from your boy Chovy. We got to yeah, talk back. He looked tilted. He looked tilted we, after that one. We need to visit that Aurelian soul and talk about that champion a little bit because of its impact in this series and especially the performance of Trophy, because as you mentioned, yes, there was a mental bounce back that needs to be acknowledged here because there was clear uh, frustration, clear tilt coming through at the end of that game. You could see him, you know, pose like this, you know, shake, you know, oh my God, I can't believe we're gonna lose this one. I can't believe my performance is not enough to get this win. That happens one away. game every series, it feels like, with Gen G, where Chovy has a fantastic performance and they should never lose the game, but somehow they do. And they hit the mental reset and they do get that bounce back. They are able to lock in. I think another thing to talk about with this series, going the full distance, they were talking about it quite a bit on the broadcast, just the environment, right? Being in that arena and the temperature, the hottest on the day so far this year in, in Korea, creates an environment where you can lead to being tired, getting exhaustion, all these mental fatigue, all these things can start creeping in a little bit more. And I think for both of these teams, mostly avoided it throughout this series, but you could certainly tell as you got to that game five, the effects, the pressure on these situations, some of that decision-making was absolutely changed in that game five. But the real win here is for Riot because number one, T1, of course, already going to MSI, but now as the second seed, you get them in that first play-in round kind of action to bump up the viewership right away. I, that's so unfair. That is so unfair <laughs> for the rest of these squads. I I, I I like this actually coming through for MSI. Let me get that out, out of the gates here first. I think it is going to be very entertaining. It's going to be all these type of things. Now, for all these other teams having to deal with a juggernaut like the defending world champions slotting in as that second seed for the LCK going up against the unkillable Demon King. Oh, Gumayushi. Oh, this is all these things. Yeah, that's going to be a pretty rough time at MSI for one of these second seeds. It was also a seemingly inevitable outcome in the LEC finals. El Clasico, Fnatic versus G2. Actually, it feels like it's been a while since we had them in a grand finals uh which is exactly what we got fresh off the reverse sweep against team bds and as soon as you saw Fnatic win that first game you say oh no now the reverse sweeps off the table g2 only gets stronger when they drop that first game and that ended up being the case in this series oh boy did they ever get stronger uh, first thing to note here for the lec is number one you saw it in the lcs the in studio finals the lcs did a little bit extra give them that credit especially in comparison to the lec absolute snoozer cannot be happening especially like especially when you see the lck what they're doing for an opening ceremony Oh. Absolutely. Without question. You can look at the LCK. You're, you know, within your own same esport. You can look at other esports and what they've had for their final events and these type of things. I don't care the cost. I don't care the organization planning all these type of things that need to go into it. This is a necessity as far as capitalizing these events, propping them up to be the level that they deserve to be, to have the fan experiences, the atmosphere, everything that it does deserve to have. LEC was robbed of it this year by having it in that studio finals because G2 should have had a studio, a full studio and more around them to celebrate this one the way that they played. Another, another a championship for Caps. 
How many has he had since he left Fnatic? It is insane. 10. Double digits just since leaving Fnatic. And Fnatic, of course, has had zero in that time. So, yeah, absolutely all paths in EU lead to caps. Uh, he had some pretty good plays throughout this series, some head-scratching ones. Truthfully, this was... This was a messy one, a little sloppy. We got down in the mud, as G2 loved to say. If you get in the mud with Fnatic, that's when you lose. But I feel like G2 were in the mud with them and still came away with the win. And yeah, this is a European mud wrestling champions, G2 here. I don't understand what they're talking about. They can absolutely get down and dirty in the mud brawl with anybody in the LEC and come out on top. This series was another example of all lane swaps that we have been seeing all across the world. And especially, though, compared to all across the world where we're seeing these lane swaps, I think we saw a very diverse reaction to lane swapping and what I should do in that situation. How do I counteract this? How do I make sure that I'm still getting something here? Uh, I think you saw Broken Blade's reaction was, well, I'm going to roll down the buffs lane. I'm going to go down Inting Scion. I'm going to find a way to get it no matter what. I don't think Oscar knew what to do with a lane swap. I think this seems is like they hadn't practiced time. it nearly as much. Yeah, I think that was very clear. Kind of the, the panic you can see in the decision making of, oh, you know, what do I do? And, you know, going mid lane and, uh, okay, you're level one farming up. All right. That's, that's, you know, something here. But I don't think that this was a prepared response at all. And especially being the direction how things were going that's a disappointment because you knew that this was coming you had to be prepared that this was a possibility if not a guarantee on the weekend that you would face this and maybe that's also why it didn't quite feel like a final on top of the venue is it felt like they were practicing strategies with some of how these lane swaps were going bb's just a level one tf run in mid lane he's the new jungler they're three man in a bot lane it was all over the place a lot of these lane swaps uh but obviously i think the fourth game was the only one where there wasn't an actual lane swap and that's when you see the han sama jinx get completely out of control spoon fed a lot of kills because he had the entire gold lead for g2 though he gets caught out in a couple of these team fights and Fnatic almost gets back into the game Oh yeah, it's the scary thing when you do have that carry that is all of that advantage all put in. It's a mighty strong threat, but once that strong threat is taken down, you get that angle, there's absolutely the house of cards falling in. And that was the concern for G2. It all holds on strong, it all ends up just totally fine. And they are away with the championship. But Han Sama with this game four performance, I think this was a necessary little shot across the bow, a little warning to everybody that yeah, I'm still in pretty good shape, pretty good form right now, especially when you're seeing some of these top notch ADC performances across the world. And he says, I only use the flash when I know that I'm gonna get a pentakill. That's what I'm <laughs> saving it for. Hey man, that's what it's that's what that charge is saved up for. You absolutely keep it in the tank for the spicy video clip pentakill. And okay, so now how do you feel about EU going forward for MSI? Because maybe you would feel even better if Fnatic wins this series and you say, okay, maybe we've got two legit teams over in EU. There's still plenty of positives. I mean, the bot lane from Fnatic, I know Noah had 11 deaths in that fourth game, but that was that was a rough one. I don't know what he's supposed to do for a lot of those plays and was obviously very tilted, but this plus the BDS series, you're feeling fantastic about that Fnatic bot lane. Oh, the, the Noah situation, I think that was very much one where it went very south very fast and his reaction was, well, I'm going to try something that is extremely you know, low odds here, given that, well, there's not really any chance of anything else working out in this situation. And that didn't work out as well. So, okay, you, you tried. I'll give him that one in that situation. There's not, not a lot of other options. Uh, I, as far as, you know, talking about where you're feeling about EU heading towards MSI, number one, I will take G2 as the number one seed. I think that there is obviously an avenue to talk about Fnatic leveling up and, and taking it and all these type of things. I think Fnatic going through, what you will have to go through is that second seed and the type of challenges that will await there. Cough, cough, uh, T1 heading through as a number two and whoever the LPL is sending, ay ay ay. That is absolutely gonna be those conversations that Fnatic is looking to level up through that point of it. And for G2, getting that number one seed, getting a little bit out of protection that you do get as that number one, I think considering the power that you carry, what you have already proven in the European region, uh, I, I would want them to take that number one spot for sure.
and G2 now going into this event is going to have that mantle from even the Eastern teams, I'm pretty sure, of, oh, God, the lane swaps this team's doing. You've seen the sprinkles of it in some of these other regions, but G2 is the one seemingly most committed to it, which means... You know, even the big dogs are going to be looking and saying, okay, we got to do this extra bit of prep against this squad. Everyone going to be spamming lane swaps and scrims. Everyone's going to be doing it, not just G2, but you better be prepared uh, for everybody else and knowing that there's going to be some gimmicks. There will be some gimmicks around it's no this secret MS. anymore. There's going to be someone figuring it out and solving it through with these lane swaps. And absolutely, someone's going to be coming with their counter to the lane swaps. I really hope that's going to be what is being cooked up, prepared in the preparation kitchens for MSI. These European teams, especially G2, with those eyes towards them. I'm looking at the big performers. I'm talking about Caps. I'm talking about Broken Blade. These guys got to be not only bringing that creativity that you're that we're talking about and being prepared for the gimmicks and the cheese but they got to be at that tip point tip top shape of their own performance at that peak caps has shown us pretty much at, at around that level of the mountain right now ready to summit and be there for uh the msi i think broken blade has got a little bit more to keep going and climbing up especially when i'm uh, i'm thinking about the type of top lane matchups that could be possible at msi and i want to give one quick shout out the yike for this series, especially the Volley Bear game. We've been waiting for more out of him. My man gets a huge triple kill, steals the Baron, and was that was the most deadly Volley Bear I've seen maybe ever on the rift. I'll give him some credit. It's been a, a little bit since we've seen a Volley Bear roll through the jungle and have that type of impact and really get that threatening feeling that the Volley Bear would had last time we saw him running through the meta and being such a prevalent option, either top or or in that jungle position. Thought that was a good one from Yike, and, and he's going to be a crucial one for G2 in continuing this improvement, continuing to pick up that experience young in his career. He's already got a little bit of that, you know, feet in the water already about international stuff. Let's see how we do at this next trip to MSI. I'll tell you one team that is banking on not having to lane swap because they don't want to because they got an absolute menace in the top lane. We don't want to see 369 sitting on zero CS at eight minutes, especially when he's putting on the Urgot and Renekton performances that we got against JDG this weekend. Oh man, dial it up. LPL, top esports, they're coming in hot. And yes siree, that hotness is landing in the LPL finals against BLG. They've secured themselves that final spot, that MSI trip as well. Top esports roll on through JDG. You're right, Mr. 369 on that Urgot on these picks in the top side. But we have to, have to talk about your boy in the bottom lane, Jackie Love, dishing out a disrespectful amount of damage to the side of JDG. You ever seen a more aggressive? Everyone's playing Senna. You're the back line, scared, waiting to get blown up. This guy's flashing in. 1v3's getting triple kills. I, I love it because, again, there is nobody else that can deliver at the professional level like this, like Jackie loved to deliver you highlight clips like that. And we can throw it alongside ulting backwards on Senna on the exact same champion less than a year ago. This dude is insane. With Blame his support. Had. It was a support's fault, not, not Jackie. We can take that one for top esports. But Jackie Love, man, he has been fantastic this year. And that has continued throughout these LPL playoffs. And I think actually we're reaching heat level 11 or 12. This dial is broken. It is gone past max right now, the way that he is performing for top esports. And how about back to back series? Top esports beating JDG not once, but twice in pretty convincing fashion, especially uh, that fourth game for TES uh, in this playoff run to book their ticket back to MSI and. Got to give a shout out to Cream on the Ari because that that was looking like old night TES on the Ari in this series. Oh, baby. He's got a matchup against Knight. Just yeah. heading around the corner. Got to be ready for that one with it. But make no mistake, these are the two best teams in the LPL. I think all the way through this gauntlet of the playoffs, this has been a f hammered out and forged through the LPL steel that this is the two best that we are going to go through and absolutely deserved squads heading to MSI 
I am so excited for this MSI event. Number one, because it's actually not that far away, guys. We've got like two, two, two and a half weeks until we're rolling into this event. Normally, it feels like such a long break after some of these finals until we get into that one. It's gonna hit pretty quick. Team's gotta be prepared and getting ready for it. And we've got the best squads heading to this MSI mega stars in the key positions. I'm so thrilled for this event. It's good that it's in China because since we're waiting until Saturday for these LPL finals to actually go, I think it's less than two weeks after that, May 1st, you got things kicking off. So luckily they don't have to travel across the globe to these LPL teams. But now we have two full Chinese rosters going matching up. It feels like it's been a while since we've had that internationally. Usually there's a couple uh, Korean imports at least. And even though JDG not going, we got both 369 and Knight there to defend their MSI title from last year. And both of them with absolutely painting targets on the back of the LCK and a couple of other, you know, maybe, you know, a little fun one on, on G2, of course, uh, a nice little Western dosage as well. Kill the lane swap team. That's that. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that 369. He's got blood out for that one to make sure that it goes down. I this is so good though what we've lined up here for MSI really lining into this one I'm thinking from the LCS perspective oh brother we got FlyQuest slotting in and against yeah. T1 and then you know oh man Team Liquid at top seed uh. oh my god this is not looking good for us only time will tell yeah all you, all you do is write down the teams on a sheet of paper and just look LCK LPL LCS on the other side and you go Oh boy, this uh, this doesn't quite add up. That's one of those ones where you have the the full on old fashioned cartoon sound for the gulp sound in your throat yeah. as you realize what's Woo! ahead of you. The eyes <laughs> pop out when you see it. Oh my God, T one J G B L G T E S. Uh, but either way, forever the underdog. You never know when the upsets will yeah. come in for these Western squads. So we should all stay excited and believe. At this year's MSI. But that's it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. Thanks for hanging out. And we'll catch you on that flippity flip.